saving grace for his love for us. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here who does not have a relationship with you or does not know you, Father, I pray that you will just prick their hearts and that they would change today and come to know you and be part of the family of God. Father, we just thank you and we just glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
amen. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship this morning. Don't they do a fantastic job? Our praise team is absolutely amazing. Thank you, guys, for leading us in worship this morning. I want to just mention we do have a cry room over here just outside the sanctuary. Your littles are absolutely welcome to stay in here with us, but I know sometimes it makes moms a little bit uncomfortable when they're when their little squirm and make noise and bother me in the least bit but if you are uncomfortable about that we do have a cry room right here now we usually live stream the service in there but you know the av gremlins will not allow us to do that for this service we're going to we're going to make sure we get it see if we can get it fixed for the second service but that door is open and so you can still hear what's going on if you need to use the cry room it's right out that door and then immediately to the right so just know that's available for you well, if you have a Bible with you this morning, and I sure hope that you do, or you can take out a, open up the Version app on your device. If you need a Bible this morning, there are some over there on that bookcase, and so feel free to grab one and use it if you need it this morning. Um, and if you don't have a Bible at home, if you don't have one usually in your house, feel free to take one of those with you. That's part of the reason that they're there, but take out your Bible. Turn with me to the last chapter of Matthew's Gospel first book of the New Testament, the last chapter of that, Matthew chapter 28. Um, that's where we are this morning. Now, if you're a note taker, I, every week I publish a note taking guide, and that is available as a downloadable either on our website or at, in the Version Bible app. There's a link down there to download it. So if you want to download that and, and follow along and take notes, this morning, I know we have a lot of first-time guests with us, so I printed off, I don't usually do this, but I've printed off a hard copy of the note-taking guide. So if you want one of those, um, just kind of stick your hand up a little bit, and um, Mike, if you can, if anybody raises their hand wants a hard copy, you don't have to be a first-time guest to want a hard copy, but if you want a hard copy, there's some over there on that bookcase. And so if you want one, just raise your hand, Mike will grab one and stick, stick it in your hand so you can follow along, take notes this morning as we go through the message. Of course, we're here this morning to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And the resurrection is one of those few events that is recorded in all four Gospels. And this morning, we're going to be in Matthew's account. And I chose Matthew's account intentionally for this morning, for our discussion today of the resurrection. Because Matthew's account intentionally deals with the skeptical mind. He's writing a polemic, an argument for the resurrection. He's intentionally addressing the skeptics. The Jews of the first century, the Jews of Jesus' day, were skeptical about the resurrection. And that's not limited to the first century. That's not limited to that group. A Lifeway research group study recently. Lifeway is the printing and research arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. And in September of 2020... They did a study, and they asked a question about people's belief in the resurrection. And they found that a third of people who responded either don't believe at all or are skeptical about the truth of the resurrection. But that's the, the big issue. That's, that's the key issue. The key point is the resurrection. Even the skeptical Jews of Jesus' day, we see this in, back in Matthew 27, they realized that if Jesus was, was raised, then there would be a flood of people that would follow him because it proved definitively he was who he said he was. This is the key issue. And so this morning, I want us to sort of consider this overarching question, is the resurrection true? Did it really happen? Is it a historical event that we know for sure took place? And here's the big idea of the text this morning. Now, if you're new with us, I like to kind of pull out the main thought of the text and, and give that right up front, sort of the bottom line up front. We're asking this question, is the resurrection true? Spoiler alert in the big idea today, absolutely. The resurrection of Jesus is an actual...
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He isn't here. He has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take my word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. There you will see me. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you. You loved us enough to leave the comforts of heaven. Come to this earth, live a life as a man, and then go to the cross for us. You died for us to pay the penalty for our sin. You were risen again that we might live in the power of your eternal life. Father, thank you for this account. And Father, this morning, as we are speaking specifically to the skeptical mind, maybe there's some here this morning that don't believe or have questions about the resurrection. Lord, as we examine this text, would you help us all to hear? Help us all to understand just what it is you have for us and what you want us to take away, how we ought to respond to you. Now bless these next few moments of worship in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're answering that overarching question, is the resurrection true? And I want to break it down into three smaller questions. Could it happen? Is it even in the realm of the possible that something like this could take place? Could it happen? Did it happen? What kind of evidence, what kind of, what, what, what reasons would we have to say that it did in fact happen? And then why did it happen? Why would God go to all of the trouble to do this? First question we're considering is this. Could it happen? Verse 1. Again, he says, Now after the Sabbath it began to dawn on the first day of the week, and these two Marys came to the grave. And a severe earthquake occurred, for the angel of the Lord descended, and he rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, his clothes as white as snow. That's a pretty wild story, right? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty bold account. And if something like that happened, it would be absolutely unparalleled, right? That's not our experience. That's not what, what we see and experience in this life. Dead men don't rise. When they go to the grave, they stay in the grave. And no other religion's talking about this. No other religion is thinking about this. This would be completely unparalleled if this event really happened. And there's a part of us, let's be honest, there's a part in every one of us that's a little bit of a skeptic. It says things that are unparalleled, things that seem too good to be true, things that seem so absolutely wild, those things absolutely couldn't happen. But though this event is unparalleled, I submit to you this morning, it is entirely possible. God is the Almighty. He is the, the creator of the universe, the one that spoke the universe into existence. When we add God to the mix, when we add him to the equation, we realize that things that are unparalleled, 
Things that you and I don't experience in our normal everyday life are absolutely in the realm of the possible. Is there anything too hard for God to do? He created life. You go back and read the Genesis account. He created life. So it's not a big step. It's, it's nothing then for him to raise someone from the dead. Now when we add God to the equation, we say, well, the resurrection, resurrection's completely unparalleled. It seems like a wild story, like something that's just too far out of our reach. But when we add God to the story, it's entirely possible. And in fact, I would take it one step further than that. Because if God is who the Bible says he is, then miracles, like the incarnation of Jesus, like giving sight to the blind, like, giving, like helping lame men walk, like the resurrection, if God is who the Bible says he is, then those things are not only possible, but they're probable. If he doesn't, if he's not supernatural, then he's natural. He's just like you and me. He's no different. We know God is supernatural. And things that are supernatural to us, things that are miraculous to us, things that are mind-blowing to us are absolutely normal. Every day to a God who exists in the supernatural realm. And when we factor in the supernatural God into this account, it shouldn't surprise us if the miraculous occurs. I would think it would surprise us if the miraculous did not occur. So we come to the question, could the resurrection happen? With God in the mix, absolutely the resurrection could happen. But then I think there is a bigger question for us to consider because just because it's in the realm of the possible doesn't mean we have anything to celebrate today. It could happen, but did it happen? Now that's a more relevant question, I think. I mentioned earlier that I chose Matthew's account on purpose. I chose it intentionally for our discussion today. And maybe you recall what Matthew did before he came to Christ. He was a tax collector. Think IRS agent. That would put it in today's context. Now, people in those career fields, IRS agents, they're not concerned with what could have happened. If you ever experience an IRS audit, I'm just going to give you a word of advice. Do not use as your defense, well, I could have paid my taxes. I just chose not to. IRS agents are not concerned with what could have happened. They're only concerned with what did happen. And is there any evidence to back that up? Matthew writes this account like a tax collector. And I want us to take the next few minutes. We're going to see five quick evidences. And when I say quick, I mean real people quick, not pastor quick. Five evidences that Matthew, the IRS agent, gives us that we can trust that the resurrection did, in fact, happen. First, Exhibit A, I'm calling it, the presence of the God. stole the body. And it says that, that story is still being circulated. They had to account for the empty tomb somehow. And that was the story that the disciples stole the body. But the presence of the guards, are, is a, it's a powerful piece of evidence for us. Because these were highly trained, armed soldiers. And we don't know how many were there. The standard Roman watch was four, so there probably were at least four guards there at the tomb. Highly trained, armed soldiers. And it's just absolutely impossible to think that a band of mostly fishermen 
who only had a few weapons among them, would have come and overpowered four highly trained soldiers. It's simply unthinkable. Maybe they were asleep. Maybe they fell asleep. That's the story that they were spreading over in verse 13. You say you fell asleep, and that's what happened. The disciples didn't have to overpower them. They just had to sneak up and do what they had to do. But that rock that was over the tomb, it was ginormous. It would have been three to four feet tall, probably an inch or a foot thick. Estimated that thing would have weighed one and a half to two tons, three to four thousand pounds. Can you just imagine the grunting and the groaning and the noise it would have made to roll that thing away? It would have woken the dead trying to roll that stone away. There's no way the soldiers would have slept through that. Now, the presence of the guards is important to us. And there was no reason for the disciples to steal the body. You recall we talked about this last week, that after the crucifixion, the disciples were disillusioned. They thought, well, maybe this was the Messiah, but now I'm not quite so sure. They had no motive to steal the body. If they had to go and steal the body out of the tomb, it sealed the deal. He was not who he said he was. He was not the Messiah. We followed after him for nothing. They had no reason to steal the body. So the guards, the presence of the guards is a powerful piece of evidence. Exhibit B, the testimony... First century Roman and Jewish cultures, women didn't count for much. In a lot of ways, they were seen as not much more than property. They were not allowed to give testimony in court. Their testimony meant absolutely nothing. Now, how does that help us see? How is that such a powerful piece of evidence to us? Because there's only two groups of people that would have included the testimony of women in the first century. Enemies who were trying to disprove the story. But all four gospel writers record that the first witnesses of this event were women. They certainly were not trying to disprove the story. The other group that would have included women's testimony in the first century were those that were merely just reporting what happened. An accurate account of what took place that day. Now, the testimony of the women is another powerful piece of evidence that we know that Matthew, the IRS agent, is pointing out to us that the resurrection actually took place. Exhibit C. Oh, 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 now, I'm, now I'm hitting the button all kinds of times and everything's popping up on the screen there. Exhibit C, the empty tomb. Listen here. The Jewish leaders of that time, they could have ended the discussion. Was he the Messiah? Was he the one to come? All they had to do was drag the body out of the tomb. There it is. There's your Messiah. The empty tomb is significant because none of the other evidences matter if the tomb wasn't empty. Verse 6, the angel says, he's not here. He's risen just as he said, come, see the place where he was lying. And it's long been pointed out that the angel rolled the stone away, not so Jesus could come out, but so that we could go in and verify this fact. The tomb was, in fact, empty. And everybody in the account verifies it. The ladies go in, they check it out, and the angel invites them to. They verify the tomb is empty. In John's account of this, he and Peter run to the tomb. They verify the tomb is empty. We're not told this specifically, but I imagine the guards verified it too. They went and reported back to the chief priests everything that happened. They wouldn't have done that without verifying what took place. Everybody verifies the tomb is empty. And the Jewish leaders never disputed it. They never said otherwise because they couldn't. 
They knew that the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. There it is. It laid in all its glory, the empty tomb. The empty tomb is another important piece of evidence that the resurrection did happen. Exhibit D, the change. Tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. Back there in verse 1, when the ladies come to the tomb, they're in a deep, deep sense of grief, a deep, deep sense of mourning. And here, in just in the span of a few minutes, something radically has changed within them. Three of the four gospel accounts reports that the disciples didn't believe the ladies when they came back. They told them about the resurrection, but the disciples didn't believe them. They weren't expecting a resurrection, and they didn't believe that it took place. They were confused. They were terrified, John chapter 20 tells us. They were terrified that they were next. But something profound changed them all. When the ladies leave, they came in great deep mourning. When they ran away from the tomb, it says they ran with great joy. Just a few minutes later, something profound happened to those ladies. And those disciples holed up in that upper room, terrified that they were next. And just a little over a month later, they don't care who hears it. They're out very publicly, boldly proclaiming that Jesus has risen from the dead. Nothing else accounts for that. Nothing accounts for that radical change. And tradition tells us that most, if not all, of the disciples were martyred. They went to the grave defending this point that Jesus was raised. No sane, rational person willingly will die for something they know is not true. Something radical changed those. The changed lives is a powerful piece of evidence. And then the last one, Exhibit E. His post-resurrection. But none of it proves a resurrection. If nobody has seen him alive, after they saw him die on that cross, if nobody has seen him alive, there is no proof of a resurrection. Everything else is just interesting discussion. This one, though, his post-resurrection appearances seals the deal. Verse number 9. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. Now, I don't know how long these ladies had been with the band of disciples that followed Jesus. But from that point forward, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they were with him. They knew Jesus when they saw him. They knew Jesus when they interacted with him. And he spoke to them, and they immediately knew who it was. They fell down at his feet and they worshipped him. There's no question in their minds. In verse 10, he mentions he'll meet the disciples in Galilee. That was a, a pre-arranged thing. They were going to meet at a specific place in Galilee. In addition to that, there are 10 recorded post-resurrection appearances of Jesus in the Scriptures. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one time he appeared to 500 people. Now listen, those are not mass hallucinations. You don't share that among 499 of your closest friends. It's not a, a mass vision. That's not the way those things work. He appeared to 500 people, and they all reported that they actually saw Jesus in the flesh. Post-resurrection appearances are huge and while we can't prove with 100% certainty that Jesus was raised, that the resurrection happened, I think the evidence gives us a beyond a reasonable doubt assurance that not only could it happen, but it did, in fact, take place. It's a real event. Now, that brings us to the last question, though. Why? Why did it happen? See, God doesn't do things willy-nilly. 
He doesn't do things for sport. He doesn't do things for mere entertainment. If God does something, there are, there's a reason. There is a purpose behind it. We say, well, why would he go to this trouble? Earthquake and an angel and the stone and all of that. Why would he do it? Why did the resurrection happen? A couple of weeks ago, we were in 1 Corinthians 15, and we are asking the question, does Easter matter? And we talked about some of the reasons why God would go to these lengths. And I'm not going to re-preach that sermon this morning. But we talked about things like hope and forgiveness that are available because of the resurrection. And if you missed that, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. And I encourage you to go back. And even if you want to just go back and review that, why does Easter matter? But I want to give you three more quick reasons this morning why God would have raised Jesus from the dead, why the resurrection happened. First is this, that if the resurrection is true, everything. read in here. Because it's not just the gospel writers that, that reference this account, but the resurrection is mentioned over and over and over again, pointed back to throughout the New Testament. And if this didn't happen, they, Paul said, your faith is useless. We have serious reason to question what the Bible says. In fact, this is such a, a grand event. It's one of the more incredible things the Bible talks about. And if something that incredible, that wild, actually took place, then we have solid reason to believe that everything else in the Bible is true. If the resurrection is true, everything in the Bible is true. Second, the resurrection is the key... birth. It's what enables that living hope, that hope that will never end and never run out. The Bible says that what keeps man from heaven is not a lack of good works. It's not that we don't do enough good things. It's not that we're not good enough people. The Bible says that's not what keeps us out of heaven. What keeps us out of heaven is sin. And God doesn't send anyone to hell. Make no mistake about that. God doesn't send anyone to hell. You and I enter this world as sinners. And that sin has separated us from God. And every one of us is on our way there by default. But what God did was he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross on Good Friday, to pay the debt for your and my sin. And then on Easter Sunday, he raised him from the dead, his stamp of approval that Jesus' payment was enough. The resurrection in a very real way, in the very real way, is what makes the good news of the gospel good news. The resurrection is the key to eternal life. That's why God did it. And then the third reason.
one who controls everything in the universe. And we have his power. That when those circumstances come up, we have his power and his presence to navigate them. Could it happen? Absolutely. Once we add God to the equation, all things are possible. The resurrection moves completely into the realm of the doable when God is in the picture. Could it happen? Yeah. Absolutely. Did it happen? Yes, it did happen. Why did it happen? So that you and I can be forgiven. You and I can be reconciled unto God. I'm going to ask our praise team to come on back up. As we sing this last song this morning, I want you to consider the things we talked about. Maybe you're one of those in that survey that would have said, I don't believe in... It's absolutely real. And because of it, you and I can have eternal life simply by trusting in the resurrected Jesus. Now in a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing our final song. And as we do, I want to, I want, we'll put the slide up after the song, and I want you to seriously consider the evidences for the resurrection. And after we're done singing, if you'd like to talk with someone, about how you can make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, have your sins forgiven, and know like you know like you know that you'll spend eternity with him in heaven. I'll be available to do that after we sing this final song. Would you stand together and let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the truth of this event. Thank you for going to such great lengths that, you, that we might have our sins forgiven that we might have the opportunity to spend eternity with you. And Father, as we sing this last song, your spirit has spoken powerfully to us through your word already this morning. And Lord, as we sing this last song, I pray that you continue to help those that might be here this morning who don't necessarily believe, never trusted in you as Lord and Savior. Would you speak to their hearts through this last song? Help them to respond, to settle that matter today. Lord, accept these next few moments as our responsive worship back to you, we pray in Jesus' name.
You want to talk to someone about how you can make Jesus your Lord and Savior, I'll be available after the service to do that. I'll hang out just right down here. Or if you've got any other questions, you need someone to pray with you or encourage you about anything else, I'll be available to do that as well. If you have one of these yellow slips, don't forget to drop it in the offering plate on your way out. And if you're a first-time guest with us this morning and I didn't get to meet you yet, I would love to do that. Would you just come up and introduce yourself to me after the service? I'd love to get to meet you. Let me pray us out this morning. And after I pray and dismiss us because we're still red, because of COVID, um, we just if we can make our way to the exit as efficiently as, as possible, um, that's what COVID rules demand of us. So let's dismiss our time in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for not staying dead. Thank you for being alive that you can give us life that we can have our sins forgiven, that we have hope because of the empty grave. And Father, we just pray that today would be a time of celebration of you, a time of celebration that you are alive. And Lord, that, that reality would be real in our lives, that people would see that living hope that we have. Father, help us to be messengers of your hope and your peace and your love for this world. Father, bless us now as we go out from here. We pray in Jesus' name.